Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your rotation-obsessed engineer, and today it's time for episode 3 of my missed Let's Play. So last time we solved pretty much all the puzzles of this island, there's a couple of things left that I want to do before we leave, but let's just open this up for now. We found both parts of this code previously, which should let us happily escape. There's a few other, a few other things that we want to do here before we move on. But we will have to uh, run back inside since we can only carry one of these magic pages at a time. But that should be technically the completion of our first our first age of mist. I love the jaunty little tune in here. So what I'm going to do is we'll dive back into mist, drop off this page, and then head back out. out to the mechanical age in order to grab the other one. This is blue, which goes to the unstable guy. Well now, what's he got to say? So he says that he is Akinar and he needs more pages for us to rescue him, which seems reasonable to me. After all, we've all um, we've all got stuck reading a book that we don't really like and just been absolutely trapped within it and unable to figure out how to go do something else. Or is that just me? Once you've opened any of these ages, you can freely dip back in and out without any real trouble, since this is the same code every time. I love a bit of mechanical audio design. I love things that go vreet kachow, things that go scroom, widdish, and other noises. But noise describing was last episode, so let's have a look in here. There's two brothers, two books two pages, so it's reasonable to assume that there's a page hidden in here as well, and I would like to find it. Ah, aha! It's less obvious than the other one. How do you hide things? Well, you put a put a tapestry in front of it. That's a solution to a lot of the problems in life, actually. Just just put a, put a little tapestry on it. Got a, uh, got a problem with your, your house? Put a, little, put a little tapestry on it. Got a problem with your, your, your you know, your, your significant other? Just uh, put a little tapestry over them. Aha, here it is. So where the other uh, secret room was obsessed with pain and possibly humiliation, here we have a room that is obsessed with the conspicuous elements of wealth. We've got treasure chests, gold, silver, bottled wines. Cirrus, your greed sickens me. Your desire for wealth and plunder is never satisfied. I will instruct my subjects not to pay your new tax, and you know they'll listen to me. Regards, Akinar. So it sounds like... This is Cirrus's room, which leads to some seriously interesting interpretations. Cirrus is apparently demanding taxes from the peoples of this place, while Akinar is proclaiming himself some kind of revolutionary leader, I suppose, but this feels much more menacing with a much more martial air. So it's not exactly a, a clever trick, it's not exactly complex, but it's a very simple and easy way to get a basic understanding of these characters. And I really enjoy that even then people were trying to tell stories in games through the medium of, of environment rather than through directly having characters just tell you things. I mean, we talk about environmental storytelling nowadays, but it's been part of the genre, it's been part of the medium since its inception almost. We have a very strong focus in this, in this game from 1993 on Telling, telling us who these people are through the things that they care about, the things that they have.
So this one's Cirrus, that one's Akinar. They both seem to want me to help them escape their books. Presumably this is some kind of factional decision. We need to decide which one we'll side with. But that itself is interesting because where is Atrus in all this? What happened to Atrus? There's a big divide between the worlds as described in these books and the worlds as they are now after Cirrus and Akinar seem to have been done with them. These books were written when Cirrus and Akinar were children as well. So let's try and see if we can get access to the next one of these worlds. We've done the cogs, so let's see where the rotation takes us next. This would appear to be something off the dock in the water. There's a, uh, a sunken ship over there, I believe we had a quick look at previously. But before we head off to actually look at the details of it, let's go and uh, see what the clues hidden in the tower are. I don't know if you've ever had access to a tower, but it really is the most appropriate place to hide clues. Every time I've ever been near a tower, I've been like, ooh, this is the place to put a puzzle. It's just something fundamental about the energy of a tower. You know why wizards like towers? It's because they're good for putting secrets in, and wizards love to hide secrets. So, looks like we've lined up exactly with our target. Let's see what the hint panel says. So, one of the interesting things about Myst is that it was the first ever fully CG rendered computer game. There were fully wireframe games previously, but I believe this was the first ever game to actually have 3D, 3D rendered images for the for the art of the game. Okay, we have three dates. I'm going to write these down. My thought is, uh, well, I know where I've seen dates previously, and the place where I have previously seen dates is in the astronomy building, the observatory. So it seems reasonable to run back over there and plug these dates in and see what we get. Which is kind of what I was saying previously about this game actually having a fairly direct thread for you to pull on. You are first told, go to the library, check out the books. You do that, and that gives you strong hints about what you need to do. And then from there it's like, well, what, am, what have I seen on the island that's to do with a clock? Well, it's the clock tower. What have I seen on the island that's to do with dates? Well, the only place I've been where I've seen dates is while sitting in the chair in the observatory. So logically, the first thing to do is go experiment with that, fiddle with it, see what it does. Mist was actually highly criticised when it first came out. Even though it was incredibly popular, it was incredibly popular with people who weren't already PC gamers. And um, while a lot of people who were into PC games already enjoyed it greatly, there was kind of a, this is for normies pushback, which is fascinating to think about now, considering it's a point and click adventure, which is one of the nerdiest PC gameriest genres imaginable. All right, let's put the first one in. Well, that's definitely a different constellation. I thought maybe it would have lines on it if it was correct. Oh well, let's note this one down. And now time for the next one, which is January 17th, 1207, at 546 AM. Note this one down as well. And then finally, November 23rd, 9791, 6.57pm. Really fucking far in the future. Thought that wasn't going to work for a second. Let's just scribble this one down as well. Right then, time to wander around and see if we can find anything resembling um, star charts, I suppose. So yeah, it was kind of surprising that there was a backlash against Myst, considering how beloved it was and how it was the best-selling game for an entire decade. But um, I can sort of see it, because the puzzles actually do... well, they don't handhold you, but they're fairly, they're fairly reasonable as compared to a lot of other um, puzzle games. So this, this apparatus must be related to the, to the boat, because we've got a sunken boat in here. 
So presumably these are the these are the constellations that we can see, but this is the artistic form of the constellation rather than the star chart form of the constellation. Uh, let's let's take a look in the book, I suppose. I'm going to skip through these until I find the one that has constellations. Aha! Ah ha ha ha! Okay, here we go. Constellation book. So let's take a so let's take a second to match these up. I believe this is the third one that we found. So that would be the beetle. And this is the second one that we found, which is a leaf. And I think the third one, or rather the second one that we found, is this one, the snake. So in a in a scene where fans of the genre wanted increasingly difficult and arcane puzzles, and the puzzles in those games were so obscure and complicated that the ga that the games companies who made them would operate tips lines. And in fact, this was actually a major revenue stream for them at the time. It's it's hilarious to think nowadays, but if I remember correctly, the management at LucasArts would often actually tell the designers, "Oh, we need uh, we need at least three more difficult puzzles in this game so that we'll get people calling the helpline." And that's just kind of hilarious to me. Capitalism going to capitalism. But you can see why a game that is primarily an aesthetic experience and just a beautiful place to explore with these puzzles which were considered by me as a child to be fiendishly difficult but which are actually uh, reasonably handholdy because they do operate on physical logic. There is, You are shown the apparatus of a puzzle and it is your job to figure out how to solve the puzzle. The puzzles in Mist are more akin to a physical puzzle that you might have as a toy in the real world rather than the absurd lateral thinking logic puzzles of other point-and-click adventures in the medium. I believe I mentioned previously, in a previous episode, the famous cat hair moustache puzzle from Gab Gabriel Knight 3, which is the iconic, ridiculous, stupid, impossible to solve puzzle. So, looks like we've got the next linking book, Access, which means it's time to go read that book. Emmett was the first to live on the rocks. He named them the rocks because that is what they were, a group of sharp rocks clustered together in the middle of a large sea. This was where Emmett lived. He enjoyed his life. Emmett would occasionally swim to nearby rocks, as it was never too far of a distance. One day, another person appeared on the rocks, for no apparent reason to Emmett. Emmett named this new person Branch. Emmett and Branch quickly became friends, swimming and hunting for fish together often. Emmett showed Branch the simple cave in which he lived, on the largest rock. Soon, Branch discovered a place where he decided to live, also on the same large rock. The sun always shone brightly in their world. The water was always dazzlingly clear, allowing them to see almost to the deep ocean floor which surrounded them. Though the sun always shone, it was never too hot for the boys. A light breeze always came from the north and cooled the area down. One day, while Branch was swimming and having fun in the water, he noticed another boy swimming. Branch brought the new boy to Emmett to find out what to call the new boy. Emmett said the boy should be called Will. Will was soon a part of the group, and all three of the boys swam and enjoyed their perfect world. At least, that is the story I was told when I arrived, today, on the island. Emmett, Branch, and Will were surprised to see me at first, but even before the night ended, we were all becoming good friends. Today, the second day on this newly created age, a strange thing happened. It was not strange to me, but the three boys did not understand what was happening. While I was relaxing under a large tree on one of the smaller islands, it began to rain. It was a nice rain that lasted for about an hour in the morning. I explained to the boys that the rain was not harmful, but they obviously still feared it. Before going to sleep tonight, I told the boys I would leave the following day. I told them that while I was gone, I would make a surprising change to their world. They did not understand, not that I expected them to. I still do not fully understand what happened today. I was experimenting with the art, testing the limits of the rules as dictated to me by father. I attempted to create a boat by writing it into the world. I thought everything was planned correctly, and yet somehow the boat had become gripped by the rock and broken in half. Although the test did not turn out as I hoped, I now have answers to a few of the questions my father never answered. As for the boat, I can see the boys enjoy it anyway, and with that I am pleased. They have played on it all day. Even though the boat cannot move, I enjoyed studying from it. It is a much sturdier platform than the jagged rocks. 
In the course of my observations, I have learned some very interesting things regarding the solar system of this age. The nights are absolutely beautiful here. I have made note of and named a number of constellations that pass above me. Also during the night, I catch glimmers of light from the horizon, which I have not been able to discover. If it is created by some natural phenomenon or by additional people on far-off islands or rocks. I should very much like to discover which. I rather suspect it is additional people, which would explain the appearance of Branch and Will. The rain today was slightly heavier than usual. Just when the boys were getting used to light rains, a small storm arrived. They were frightened by the heavier rain, not to mention the thunder and lightning. If rain has never fallen here until recently, as the boys tell me, I would like to discover why it is falling now. Regardless, I have decided to return home for a short while. I have also been thinking of some plans for a lighthouse that I hope to construct soon. I think that perhaps by shining a bright light towards the horizon, it might prove my suspicions regarding additional inhabitants. They would be curious about the light and travel to discover its source, if they have the means. I have returned with many tools that I will need for construction of the lighthouse. I have decided that once the lighthouse is completed, I will leave for some time and let the world's own imagination have control. We have worked three weeks on the lighthouse now and are making great progress. The rock that we are building on seems not to be as secure as I would like. I had to alter my plans slightly, but those alterations pose no real problem. The boys are quite strong and have been helping immensely. I estimate construction will be done within two days. The lighthouse is finished and we are all proud of our creation. The boys are amazed at the structure wrought from rock with their own hands. That evening, we powered up the generator, much to the boys' dread at first, and shone a great light to the horizon for many hours. I stayed the night in the top of the lighthouse, and in the morning awoke to observe the sunrise, without my being coated with the chilly blanket of ocean dew I had become accustomed to. It was Will who first saw the girl. She was swimming not far from the boat where Will was getting ready to hunt for fish. Then Will noticed a man not far from the girl. Emmett was very pleased to meet these additional neighbours. I feel pleased to leave this age. I have set in motion events that have nothing to do with writing or the art that will have a more profound impact on this world than I could ever have written. I think of this age as a gift to myself that I will wrap up and open someday in the future, only to discover that it has changed so much that indeed it is a surprise. Besides, I have yet another new age that awaits me. It seems I'm going to need some way to travel underwater in this new age, so much planning is in order. It has been ten years since I left this age, which I have since called the Stone Ship Age. Upon returning, I cannot believe the changes that have taken place. The original three boys have grown into adults, and there are many new faces that I do not recognise. Branch told me it has not rained for seven years and the cool breezes are back again. They are all very content and have been serving me with new foods and showing me new materials they have discovered. It seems they have even found gold somewhere. I see it in many forms around the island. My lighthouse has been kept in perfect condition and looks as if they have tried the very best to keep it so. Yet I have noticed that the entire rock it was built on has sunk by approximately 40 or 50 centimetres. After a wonderful visit with my old friends, I wonder aloud with them what things will be like in another ten years. So this one is almost this one is almost the first book. It isn't the first one we have access to, but it's just a self-contained little story about this island. And we've learned some new things about Atrus and his art. We know that he this is not something that his people do naturally necessarily, this is an art that he's learned from his father, the ability to create these books and through them travel through into other worlds, but also the ability to have power over those worlds. There's an interesting combination between these two capacities, that he can both create these worlds, but he does not dictate what's in them, but he can also modify them if he wants to. So, let's just head back over to the ship, and then next episode we'll head off into the Stone Ship Age, and see if the puzzles start to get a bit more complex. Thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and especially share, and check out my Twitch channel for regular streams. On Twitter you can find announcements and one-tweet micro-reviews, and if you like what I do and want to support me, you can donate on Patreon or Ko-fi. The links are all in the description, and thank you so much for watching.